It's race week, the first of 21 this year. This is indeed the Crash Moto GP podcast. The recording date is Monday, the 28th of February. My name is Harry Benjamin. Alongside me, Crash Moto GP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Ewan. Coming up, new red flag sporting rules announced. Suzuki finally reveal a team manager. Plus, we'll look ahead to what's in store for our Moto2 and Moto3 riders for this season. And Keith is back with his insider's guide as we gear up for Qatar. Uh, but before everything, I don't think it would be quite right to not touch on the uh, horrific acts currently going on between Russia and Ukraine. If you're feeling like you want to help or support Ukraine during this awful invasion by Russia in any way, that the Red Cross in the UK uh, have set up a crisis appeal and the link is on the screen now for you and will also be in the podcast description if you click on that it gives you a myriad of ways that you can help support or just find out more information and all our thoughts are uh, with the people of ukraine during this uh, awful awful time um but today we'll carry on to talk more about moto gp this season as it is race week and we are gearing up for our first weekend just a few days away and uh, Pete, actually, it might be worth coming to you first just on this. Um, new sporting regs uh, were announced actually just after we'd released the podcast last week concerning red flag conditions and a slight tweak to these rules. What do we know about this and, and why have they done that? Yeah, just just a bit of tidying up, really. You can see all the, all the details on Crash, shall we say. But it was, it was for specific circumstances where the race leader had already completed a lap and then you get a red flag, and then it's sort of how far back do you, do you count back for the final result? So that's really what it's about. It was already the case for if, if the chequered flag had been shown, the leader had taken the chequered flag, and then there was a red flag. So what they've done is just sort of tidied things up and made it so that that now applies to all red flag situations. So yeah, the, the details you can find on the website, but basically it means it's a bit more consistent, and it just takes away that doubt of, of where do you, you count the final result from when you get a red flag. Significant, I think. I think it's a it's a tweak that's long time coming. It should have been a while ago. It's always confusing at the end of a race when you're trying to work out who crossed the line, whether it's going to go back a whole lap or whatever it was going to do at that particular time. So I think significant, and uh, even though it's only really a minor tweak, it's uh, it's it's has a major result. It's a major clarification, I think. Mm, well, as uh, Pete says, all the uh, finer details are on the website crash.net. Now, one of the big, actually, breaking stories as well to come out from the last week ahead of this weekend is uh, after a lot of speculation, we t- spoke about it a lot. We thought Davide Brivio might be coming back from Formula One. That doesn't appear to be the case anymore because Livio Supo uh, has been named as the new Suzuki MotoGP team manager. Keith, uh, what did you make of this one then? Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, Livio. I love Livio Supo. I think he's a tough character. He's He's got a great presence in the paddock, knows what he's on about. Uh, it be interesting to see how he gels with the rest of the Suzuki team. I think Brivio had got a very nice... Uh, he was embedded with Suzuki right across the board from the lowest technician. Sorry for using that word, lowest technician. That is not the way to speak, Keith Ewan. From any technician right the way through to the factory, um, and I think Livio Supo's got some work to do regarding that particular relationship, um, but he'll get there straight away. I rate Supo. I think this is a good appointment, and I think Suzuki needed someone that's quite strong in there, and I think Supo will fill that gap pretty well, from my own opinion. Yeah, well, titles, obviously, with Ducati and Honda, Pete, so he's got the pedigree, and I believe you reached out to him last year, and he said, well, he was keen. He was just waiting <laughs> to see if he had the phone call. That's it, yeah. I mean, as soon as we were all sort of surprised when Brivio left for Formula One, that's the first thing to say, isn't it? Suzuki, not least, was surprised. So, uh, yeah, he was the first person that sort of popped into my head as someone to contact, so I sort of immediately sent him a message, what do you think about this? And as you say, he certainly didn't rule it out, did he? He said, let's... Uh, yeah, I mean, when he left the paddock, we should say, at the end of 2017, uh, you know, it was very much a never-say-never never thing. And so, he, you know, it wasn't that he excluded the chance of coming back. He'd always been open. And I think this opportunity, as Keith says, factory team. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that Brivio and Super, they're, they're quite similar on paper. Italian, similar age, won titles with two different manufacturers, as you say. 
but completely different personalities, as Keith was saying. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Supo's going to give, I think, Suzuki a lot more firepower generally in terms of negotiations with riders, with sponsors, etc. Supo was the guy at Ducati that brought in Philip Morris, of course, when they when they created that team. I mean, Suzuki at the moment don't have a title sponsor. Um, Supo's got sort of a marketing background as well. So you wouldn't be surprised if he's able to also help the team in that way. So yeah, I think it's a smart move, as Keith says, you know, it's going to help them across the board. And he's someone that, that he knows what he wants, and he knows how to win. And he's been there and done that, as Keith says. So I think, it, yeah, it's a good move. We don't know, you know, it's taken a long time, hasn't it? As you say, the, the, the phone call eventually came a year later. Um, we don't know exactly what has gone on during that time because Suzuki was saying by the end of last season, OK, we realise we do need a team manager. It seemed like they were close to a deal and then they, there was nothing and, and there was some sort of delay. They didn't want to say who they were speaking to. It sounded like more than one person. Um, but anyway, the deal has been done and it's done in time for the start of the season. And that's the important thing because it was starting to get a bit... Of a, you know, you think, well, how can a factory team, a MotoGP title winning team just a couple of years ago, not be able to find a team manager, you know, in this amount of time? So they've got that in place. His first priority, you've got to imagine, is to do the deal with Mir, isn't it? To try and keep him on board um, because, you know, those deals are being done now. We've seen Banyai. We spoke last week about Banyai's deal. So that will be one of the first things I think that, that he has to do. I don't think there's any previous negotiations that have gone underway between Supo and Mia. There's no baggage of any kind, shall we say. You know, it's not that, that, that they were in previous negotiations at Honda. Uh, I think that Mia's negotiations with Honda before he joined Suzuki, that was with Alberto Pooch, who took over from Supo. So I think there's no issues there. I think that, you know, Supo can just come in, work with the right, and the same goes with Alex Rins and, and try and do these deals and things like that. So. Yeah, a big move for Suzuki. I think it's, a, it's a, as Keith says, a, a good move for them all round. Experience of a satellite team as well, running satellite teams, I should say, as a factory. You know, he was there when Ducati started setting up, setting up satellite teams. He was at Honda. They had satellite teams. We know Suzuki is maybe looking at a satellite team in the future. So he can also help with that. So it's just across the board, someone with incredible experience and past success. So, yeah, good move. Good signing all round. Suzuki, when you think about it, I mean, they might have been talking to a lot of people, but there aren't that many people out there. Plus the fact it's difficult to leave the paddock. I think Supo's been away from the paddock long enough to make him want it back, you know, to want that kind of appointment as well. So good all round, good for the sport, good for Suzuki and good for the riders. And I reckon good for Livio Supo as well. Good news all round. Um, now, Quattararo. Banyaya, Martin, Zarco, Marquez, Espargaro, Miller, Binder, Oliveira, Mir. Those are all the names included on the Crash.net's uh, contenders for this year's title. That's a lot of names. Um, and you have to start, I suppose, with Fabio Quattararo, the reigning champion, who's got possibly the most uh, to, to get out of this year as well. And, and it's difficult, I suppose, Keith, to try and get a prediction in as we uh, found last year but looking at just some of those names and what we've seen from testing and how well people go around Qatar what are you thinking for for this season we've we've spoken about Ducati obviously have a, a huge amount of bikes on the grid as well it's going to be a, a really tight tight battle hard to I think I can't remember who said it first because it's been said many many times winning a world title is easier than hanging on to one um, and that in itself sounds a little bit flippant but it's a fact that to win a second world title back to back is 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 not quite as easy as uh, some people might have you you think I think Wayne Rainey alluded to it years ago by the way Wayne Rainey signed for the Festival of Speed down at Goodwood I'll be working down there during that weekend as well and um, we've got some very exciting things coming up there so Hopefully, we'll get a bit of a word with him for a crash as well. So we'll we'll try and do something with Wayne for there. But there's a man who knew how to win multiple world championships. Think there's a man who knew how to win. Wayne Rainey, Yamaha, looked very, very dominant back in the day. They had, obviously, huge um, competition from Suzuki and from Honda back in the day too. But now, it's competition across the board. The reason it's so difficult to, to predict who's going to be world champion is because... By the time we get to the end of this season, we are going to have, you know, maybe maybe nine or ten winners again uh, during the course of the year. So it's really it's about consistency. It's about nailing that time. That every single time you're out on a racetrack is getting the maximum points that you can with the bike you've got and the performance you're able to achieve at that time. And I think that's where Cotteraro scored real well during the course of the year. This year, I can see it being a bit more of a dogfight. 
I think there's a few, you know, there's, there's there's some real fight in some of the dogs that are going to be out there. And I think Bang Naya is looking, his performance last year, Ducati is looking really, really good. Then you've got the likes of Bastianini on the rails, coming up on the rails. I mean, Bastianini, who's to put out, uh, you know, a, a rookie type rider coming up and sort of the established, everyone, all the, the smart pundits are putting money on your Quattararos and so on and so forth. But then you've got someone like Bastianini. If he gets a good run at it early on, staying injury free is another speculation that you've got to with, with motorbikes. I mean, it's not like the Formula One stuff. It's more about, you know, the mechanics of things and how a team has, has managed to put the, the season together. With with bikes, it's about not having an injury, carrying an injury mid-season. The, 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 the events are so close together during the course of the year. You get a you know, even a strain or a sprain somewhere and it's going to affect your performance. I mean, these guys, by the time we get to mid-season, virtually the whole field are carrying an injury of some kind. And I predict as well this year, not before bloody time, that, that we're going to be a bit stricter on the odd bang on the head as well. I think that, that somewhere along the lines, there's been so much pressure that's been put from afar. Surely someone somewhere in Dorna, Erta, the FIM, are going to come up with a set of a strategy for people that have been concussed or suspect of concussion. This is something that's been, people have been slipping through the net over the last few years that really shouldn't slip through the net when it comes to head injury. So I think we might even have a little bit more emphasis on that. No one said anything, I haven't heard anything, but you can be sure they're all talking about it behind the scenes. So maybe that will come to interfere. The pandemic, is it done? You know, like, we, we, we look like we got rid of one pandemic. Now we've got a, a potential world war going on in the background. I mean, these are things not to be too flippant about. We don't know where this is all headed at this particular point. You know, this is serious stuff when somebody's, you know, talking as they were during the course of the weekend, Putin. I mean, how can you have a world leader talking about strategically maneuvering his nuclear weapons into a state of readiness? I mean, what? I thought the world was mad before Putin has escalated things to the state that he's escalated in, whatever the reasons behind it, and I don't think any of them are justifiable from a personal point of view, but when somebody is a world leader is, is threatened, the, the biggest nuclear you know, armed country in the world is talking about that, I think we should all be a little bit shaky in our boots. I am, even at my bloody age. It's it's a scary time, isn't it? And it's it's not one to uh, to dismiss too flippantly uh, at all. And uh, you know, we, we lost a lot of races last year. Obviously, well, a couple of races last year due to COVID and, and and things being moved around again. So, Pete, that could certainly be another factor that we, that might come back because you know we've got we've got this thing going on in Russia, but also you know this pandemic is isn't, hasn't gone away. It's just sort of lessened, I suppose. Exactly, Harry. I mean, the the calendar we've got. It's supposed to be 21 races. They sound quite confident at the moment, Dorna, that they will have all those races. Now, I think of those, you've got five of them that haven't, five events that haven't taken place since the pandemic began. You know, you've got, it was a Sepang, Burrum, Argentina, Mategi, you know, the other one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looks, looks yeah. through notes. Uh, uh, and, <laughs> and you've got two more. You've got Finland and Indonesia coming in. So I think it's about seven events, basically, that haven't been on the calendar for two years or, or have not been on the calendar at all. Now, that changes the, the, you know, the, the character of the calendar as well. When you look at those circuits like Mategi, Sepang, Borurum, Argentina, uh, Phillip Island is the other one, isn't it? You know, they're, they're power tracks, if you like, a lot of them. Now, you know, you've got... <laughs> I think it was Oliveira that said it, that these aren't, it isn't just a case of increasing the number of races. It changes the, you know, just the character of what sort of bike you need over a full season. When you just have a European season, you have races like Jerez, Le Mans, Mizano, those sort of tracks, the, you know, the traditional tight, twisty tracks. And, and then these newer tracks haven't been there. So I, I think, yeah, that, that is, it is worth bringing up, that it is going to change a little bit. It adds a more unknown. Remember, none of those tracks will have been used with the new Michelin rear tyre even. That was introduced for the start of 2020 as well. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many unknowns going into this season that, uh, yeah. It's, gonna... it's, a, it's another reason, another reason why Ducati have the advantage going into the year. Eight bikes out there on the track, all that data, brand new motorbike, brand new racetracks that, you know, they've not got enough data on. You get Mandalika, the Indonesian round, I mean, with the track breaking up, is that going to actually be a race at that time of the calendar. You know, is that track going to be up to spec? Are we going to arrive there and great big rocks are going to be flying out of it and we're going to have some kind of boycott when we get there? That's not been answered yet. You know, will it be moved later into the season? 
Well, we'll have to uh, wait and see on that one. I did actually speak to one of the people who designed that track. It doesn't have anything to do with the actual laying down of it, but uh, Mark Hughes, who designs a lot of tracks uh, and has done for many years, including the Abu Dhabi changes as well. And uh, at the time, I think when all the the threatened the threatening of, oh, we're going to have to move this race, he said, um, you know, it, it's already begun. We are already dealing with it. But how quickly and actually how much is happening on the ground he couldn't quite confirm so uh, that will still very much have to be a uh, uh, wait and uh, seen um let's leave moto gp there for a second and we'll come back to it and uh, have a look further into qatar i want to move on to moto 2 and moto 3 which i suppose we've sadly a little bit neglected over the last uh, couple of months but uh, it is back in action they've been testing as well uh, and they of course gearing up too to join in qatar moto 2 let's start with uh, pedro acosta the wonder kid set uh, the portimao lap record smashed it ended two tenths faster than his teammate fernandez as well on the the final day um is he gonna do the triple and, and do this year get the title and move straight into moto gp and then i think he's still got enough time to unseat marquez as the youngest uh moto gp champion if he can do it in that uh, in that quicker fashion Gotta say, he's got that kind of style and talent that you you would you wouldn't bet against it. I mean, I've got to say that I've been like mega mega impressed with the way he's got straight on that Moto Two bike. He has got that kind of Marquez talent, and we saw the way he did magical things on the Moto Three bike. Even when he looked slightly out of control, he still had control of the of the thing. I mean, uh, he's got a special touch with the motorbike, um, and I can see that carrying through. I've actually. Because I knew you were going to ask later on, Harry, that we were going to have to start predicting who was going to do what Absolutely. this year. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. The impossible <laughs> task of trying to predict who's going to do what during the year. But I've actually got Acosta for winning Moto 2 this year. Oh. Well, you know what? <laughs> That's not going to be a, a completely surprising thing. But actually, the other thing on this that I wanted to bring up was this this uh, 16-year-old Fermin Aldeguer as well, who many a touting as could be... You know, another rival, 16-year-old, he finished fourth during testing. He won nine out of 11 races in the CEV European Moto2 Championship. So it might not be, Pete, complete plain sailing for Acosta. No, uh, I mean, <laughs> not complete plain sailing. But again, you, you've got to work on the principle that he's just starting his Moto2 career and he's already this quick. He's not going to get slower. So, I mean, this is impressive. This is in many ways. We spoke When we spoke about Raul Fernandez a year ago and we were all... You know, highlighting the fact that Moto3 Grand Prix rookies, they've ridden a Moto3 style bike for years in, in the classes just below Grand Prix, whereas a Moto2 bike is, is, is something completely different. Well, Acosta's now come in, as Keith says, he's adapted to this bike almost immediately. He's, he's right up there at the top, breaking lap records, leading the official test. We've only had one official test, we should say. That's also why we haven't spoken much about Moto2 and Moto3, because they, this year they've only had one official test, and that was it at Portimao so it's finished with the Costa fastest and and yeah I think everyone knew he was going to be quick everyone knew he was talented but I think even the people that that, that rate him highly you know if you told them he's going to lead the official test lap record pace already I think they would have said well it'll take him a, a little bit longer than that but I mean you, yeah I think you've got to say he's, he's, he's one of the favorites going into the season already he has to be considered um, as one of them when you look also at the guys that have left the class you know you've got Gardner's gone and uh, Bezeki's gone and Raul Fernandez is gone. So the guys he's got to beat, there's, there's sort of a bit of a, a gap there. There's no clear leader to step up, shall we say. And then you've got the rookie guy coming in now and, and already putting pressure on them. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've never seen a rookie Moto2 champion, we should just say. You were speaking about Marquez, Marquez's record in MotoGP. So Acosta could make a record this year as well. If he, you know, Raul Fernandez, he got to the final round. Marquez also got to the final round in terms of the Moto2 title, but they both couldn't quite get there. So if Acosta does win the title this year, he'll be the first rookie to win that, that Moto2 class. Right back, I think, if you go to 250, back to Danny Pedrosa was the last guy, and that was in the two-stroke era. So, yeah, I mean, very impressive, very impressive. And to pick up on what Harry said, I think, Pete, it's important. Could he do the triple? Could he go Moto3, Moto2, MotoGP? Got to remember that Moto3, Moto2 gap now is much bigger than it used to be. We've got the Moto2 is much closer technology-wise and performance-wise to MotoGP. So he's more than halfway there if he's quick already. I suppose a, a, a quick word of caution, of course. Portugal, you know, pretty much knows the track, pretty much knows, you know, it's one of those situations where... It's a big wide world that we're going into with, with uh, those Moto2 bikes, and uh, they have been known to bite just a bit. He ain't going to get away with some of the liberties he got away with on a Moto3 bike. 
Um, and there are going to be some big names pushing and shoving. Uh, you know, I don't say it lightly when I think Acosta's going to win it, but he just looks special. You know, and that's the what isn't it the wonderful thing about motorbike racing? You know, Moto3, Moto2, Moto2, Moto2 GP, you can have as many predictions as you like. There are going to be so many people in it in the mix for winning races during the course of this year across all three classes. Just fantastic. It just doesn't get any better. And yet it does every year. And looking at, at MotoGP the following year, of course, KTM have a problem there, don't they? They have too many riders yet again. Uh, you know, where would they put a cost if they can keep it? And let's be honest, you can bet that MotoGP guys, we were talking about Livio Supo. Now, Livio Supo, when he was at Ducati, and that's probably the closest comparison with the Suzuki situation, isn't it? Not the, the giant of Honda, but being a small manufacturer like Ducati. And he was always one of those pe people that said, you've got to take a risk. You've got to do something different when you're, when you're a smaller manufacturer like that to try and beat the bigger guys, if you like. Uh, you know, look at him signing Casey Stoner, moving to Bridgestone Tires early. You wouldn't rule out Supo making a bid for Acosta or something like that. It would just fit with his character in the past. He put, he's the one who brought Miller through for Moto3. You know, he's, he's not afraid to take a big decision on, on, a, on a young rider that he thinks can, can do the deal. So the point being, KTM, they, they could have a fight on their hands for Acosta. And Ralph Fernandez, what's, the rumours are still there that, that Yamaha, OK, they had to pause their negotiations because KTM had the contract. But, I mean, if that contract finishes this year, do they then restart them in a few months' time? And... Maybe say, Raoul, the M1's still waiting for you. You know, there's, uh, someone will have to leave if Acosta is to join KTM, certainly. You mentioned Yamaha. Yamaha always seem to be on the back foot on this sort of situation, don't they? When it comes to the hiring of, of, of top talent back through the depth, they never seem to quite get that right. They've been really fortunate their motorbike has suited uh, the likes of Quattararo, and he's, he's been the leader for, for them for some time. But they're always a little bit behind. I noticed that as well this morning, Hervé Poncharo said this year's KTM is a massive upgrade on what they've done before. So they're, they're, they're a, it's going to be interesting to see what KTM managed this year. But when we get to Qatar, that's it. Cut-off time, concessions, you know, for Aprilia only. Everyone else, is, that's the motor they're running for the rest of the year. There are only going to be minimal things that they're going to be able to do from a technical point of view for the rest of this year. I don't know. I think KTM have, have kind of just slightly missed the boat a bit with that. We'll wait and see. It's interesting to hear that Hervé has said that this year's bike is a lot better. I haven't quite worked out whether that was PR speak or, um, or, or whether it's actual yet. You never quite know. So uh, a conversation with Hervé might be in order. Either way, it looks like it's going to be a crack of the season.